every journey will be different because your your environment is going to be different your your variables are going to be different what i'm looking to cover in this session hopefully over 19 minutes or so is uh, talk about my journey in many ways uh, you may be able to find parallels in your own journey from there and then we'll talk about um, how to tackle the early days when you're looking to become a pm uh, what is it that you need in terms of skill sets what gaps will be uh, staring at you when you go for your interviews how do you address those gaps and then assuming you make it to the other side and you become a pm how do you be successful in being a pm that that's the area i wanted to cover uh, i had done this session uh, i think about 6 months ago and back then uh, there was enough feedback and demand for for me to come back and do the session again that's the reason i'm covering it again this time in terms of my background uh, specific to product management i've done this for over 8 years now but that thing was from from us about 6 months ago but yeah i've been in in product management alone for about 8 years and uh, across that 7 year 7 8 year life span in product management i've built four different families of products each family having their multiple products within it Uh, and that spans across my time at Cisco, my time at Aero Hive. Those two are the primary places where I did product management. In my current role at Splunk, I'm more involved in the outbound side of product management, less on the inbound side. So I don't do as much product development style inbound product management. I'm more focused on customers, sales, field, on that side of the aspect of the of the PM uh, responsibilities. Um, over this time over these these seven years i have seen products going from concept business case development the very early days all the way up to design all the way up to launch and then sustaining it and then finally doing the end of life so i have seen the concept to grave of multiple product families so i should be able to talk to that as well in terms of my my technology involvement uh, when i was at cisco and at aero hive because i was so much more inbound focused every time we were looking to build a new product it was not just to replace the old one it was also to do something that was fundamentally different in that space something that others haven't done before because that eventually becomes a usp for selling the product as part of doing that i was able to file for three patents out of which one has already been approved um prior to technical prior to product management i was doing technical marketing i'll talk about that when i get to the next slide when i talk about the overall journey and i was in engineering before that um on the personal front outside of work just to give you a preview um i'm a dad i am a husband i've got uh, a busy home with two dogs and a child and outside of work when i'm not doing all this i'm busy doing spartan races i've got a spartan sticker on my my laptop as well but uh, that's the one thing i do outside of work out of grad school i started as a qa person in assisco I was in the wireless group. Uh, my job was to primarily test out the new new features that they were introducing on the wireless side of the house, and obviously file paths, standard QA responsibilities. About two and a half years into that role, I realized that I wanted to do more than what I was doing because when you when you be at a role long enough, you start to see the patterns in it. Uh, when you're at the start of a release or when you're, when you're planning for a release. you're writing your test plans as a qa person then you're executing your test plans and then you're filing bugs and then you're verifying bugs then you're closing bugs and then all of that is done you all go celebrate the releases out now again you start writing your test plans so it takes a little while to see and establish that pattern once you establish the pattern you realize okay where's the excitement and this applies to all roles except for product management that is that's why i'm still in the product management field uh did QA uh, as part of that i was able to file for a couple of patents at in that world as well um got a lot of exposure but what i realized as a QA person was i was getting pulled into a lot of customer escalations when customers used my product when customers deployed my feature and they ran into issues they would raise a support ticket with cisco or whatever i for that matter they would those support tickets would then find its way to the escalation team which only deals with the high priority bugs from customers and uh, escalations would pre predominantly rely on QA to verify something for them and that's where i got my first taste of uh, the way my products are used in the field how am i customer how am i customers using it why are they using it in a particular way why am i testing this particular scenario i didn't intend to use my product that way so 
So that opened up my uh, my mind to all the ways in which customers use the product. And that made me more curious. That's where I said, okay, let's see if I can pick a role which is still technical, where I can still use my technical abilities, but I can be closer to the customer, solve real customer problems. That's where uh, that's where the whole journey to TME came in. And when I was finishing up with my QA gig, I had an option of either going and doing a part-time MBA or finding another intermediate role that can still lead me into product management. Now, I'm not here to tell you if MBA is better or if not doing an MBA is better. I can tell you that you can get to uh, the PM role without an MBA as well, especially in the Valley where companies value technical skills a lot. I'm not saying that they don't value business skills. They do value business skills and there is a place and there are companies that hire that kind of talent. Uh, but bulk of the companies will still value someone who's very technical at the same time is good in front of customers and can present well. At the very minimum, you have those three qualities. You should be able to qualify for most of the entry level PM jobs and use your technical skills as your USP to get into the room. At least that's what I have observed. So again, I'm not promoting MBAs. I'm not, uh, I'm not bashing them either. Uh, so then what I said was, okay, let me find an intermediate role that will take me closer to that PM dream of mine. And Cisco has this role and Cisco and many other companies, Cisco, HP, Juniper, Aruba, all these companies have a role called as technical marketing engineer. How many of you are familiar with that role? Have you heard about it? Okay. So uh, different companies do technical marketing differently. When you hear technical marketing, most companies have technical marketing for competitive testing. And that's the primary role, writing white papers, doing presentations, doing demos, that kind of stuff. For the most part, that is what the role does. The role that I was in as technical marketing had all of that except the competitive part. We had, we had at Cisco, we had a dedicated technical marketing team that ripped open all the product hardware and did the competitive testing. So I wasn't a part of that team. I was a part of a product team where my job was to go deeper into the product used my QA skills to get more hands-on, which I saw that some of the other TMEs would struggle with because they didn't have as much of the hands-on exposure. Now, had I come from a development background, then I would have been a bit more comfortable with the code. Uh, I, would, I would be able to just look into the code repo and find out where exactly a, a problem may be occurring. Um, just to tell you, the role that you're in right now can be very relevant when you become a solutions architect or a TME or whatever this intermediate role may be. Now, what worked in my favor at that time was the TME team and the product management team were all part of the overall marketing group. So let's say you have a product group, there is an engineering team, a QA team, and then there's a marketing team. Marketing is a misleading term there, but marketing uh, involved business development, product management, and technical marketing. And that allowed me to be very close to my product management peers. Um, I would build demos for them. I would uh, go on the road, talk to customers for them. I would bring customer feedback to the engineering team. Cisco has the, the, the annual user conference called uh, Cisco Live. I would go present over there. And all those things create a very safe haven for you to not just be close to the product and to the customer, but also continue to build that deeper engagement with your product team. So did that for some time, probably a year and a half, I think. I did that for a year and a half. And at the end of it, when I wanted to become a product manager, I chose my own team, my own BU, to, to become the product manager. And the reason I did that is because I have always followed the recommendation, and this is my own thought process. Others may see this differently. When you're looking to go from your current role to a new role, and let's say the new role is designed to be more exciting, that's why you want to go there, try to keep only one variable. Don't try to keep too many variables. So let me explain that. I was a TME for my product, Switches. I wanted to be a PM, and I decided to be a PM for my own products, the Switches. If I were to become a PM, and if I wanted to go do a new product, like let's say cloud, now I have a technology gap and I have a roles and responsibilities gap. That is not bad, but it puts additional pressure on you in the initial months to prove your value.
to me at least that's how i treat my roles i find it very uncomfortable to not be in a position to add value when i join and this is expected when you go into a new role first month first couple of months will be a time where you're still learning and people understand that people acknowledge that they give you the time to ramp up but you want to find the opportunity to contribute that's when you become valuable to them so if you have too many variables that time taken from start to the point where you're adding value is a longer duration of time i kept my technology the same which is why all i had to do was learn the pm skills but when i i could still go in front of customers i could still do demos i could still talk about it so i was already valuable in some ways so i was able to shorten that that journey from being a uh, day 1 pm to adding value so that is something that i encourage all of you to keep in mind if you are in a current group where you think based on your relationships there is a higher probability of becoming a pm in your own group then i urge you to go uh, follow that path just because of all the similarities that you have built in if you were to go to a new place as a pm it's not impossible it will just be a little more harder finally after cisco after about 2 years of doing a product management gig at cisco i moved to erohai it's a smaller company much smaller than cisco is uh, a little over 100 million dollars 100 to 150 million dollars in revenue um, i went there as a senior product manager for their wireless portfolio by the time i was done i was owning the entire product portfolio except the new cloud platform so i had all of hardware and the legacy cloud platform and the embedded os in uh, in my team and i had a team reporting to me over my 4 years going from you know the wireless guy to having the whole portfolio minus the cloud so i was able to grow and i was able to learn a lot about the product management um role and its responsibilities and its challenges and a whole bunch of skills that come along the way in that small company i i could i have learned those at cisco i could have just it being a larger company it would have taken me a little longer to learn it that's all but that that experience from ero high was very very invaluable for me because i literally saw the entire life span of being a product manager from the early days building a business case all the way up to uh, uh announcing end of life on the product and then finally uh i finally moved into splunk from with a with, with an intent of doing uh field based product management field facing product management i think i have a typo that it says engineering it's not engineering it's field facing product management should correct that so yeah and and today my my role and responsibility is on the outbound side um i'm focused on everything from understanding where splunk sells how do we sell into each of our segments doing more of the outbound gtm and and product penetration um a uh, uh, product penetration uh, uh, analysis and things like that so that's my focus today uh from today's session i want to walk you through the thought process of going from the time you decide some of you said you're still considering uh, getting into product management so i want to walk you through that early phase how do you decide what skills do you need what to be ready for what not to expect all of that that early phase then i want to talk to you about interviewing for the product management role then we'll talk about what kind of challenges you would face along the way what kind of usual challenges i can't get a complete list but if you have questions we'll get to that as well and um, finally i want to talk to you about building a solid 30 60 90 day plan once you become a pm because to me that's where by the time you by the time you hit 90 days you should be adding value if not you have to figure out what's what's not working in your favor but my but that's the that's a plan i have followed it's worked very well for me uh, that's something i want to spend some time on and then we can wrap up so let's talk about the early phase explore and understand why you want to be a pm and what does it take to be a pm you need to ask yourself why why is it that you want to do this and it better be a good reason it it better be that you want to solve customer problems or you want to understand uh you want you want a good career path ahead find out your why everyone's why is different it's necessary to understand that and the reason is necessary to understand your why is because when you start interviewing for the role and you start facing roadblocks and you start facing rejections and you are contemplating if i should continue down this path or not that why is the one that will keep you afloat if your why is not strong enough you will quit and you will go back to doing what you were doing so have a solid why 
uh, what if, what if it doesn't work out and what if it does work out. If it does work out, we have a plan that I'll, that I'll take you through. If it doesn't work out, you have to understand where is it that you're lacking? What skills should you be plugging in and what, what gaps you should be plugging in so that you can have a successful interview? And an interview is not as linear as it looks. It's really complex because you're dealing with people and people means you're dealing with all kinds of variables. The people have all kinds of biases about what they're expecting from the candidate and you're dealing with that. So when you face rejections, don't, it's not as much you as much as it's about them having expectations off of you that you may not be meeting. The one thing that I highly encourage everyone to do, and this is the, the, the easiest and the, 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 the cheapest form of assistance you can receive, talk to people in your existing group. If you are in a group and if you, have, if you know people in the PM team, go talk to them. Take them out for lunch, take them out for a coffee, talk to them. The reason I don't recommend talking in a regular office setting is because they have work, you have work, and people tend to let their guard down when they're outside work. When you go for a walk, when you go get a coffee, when you go get lunch, people are more relatable and they are willing to help out and give the guidance that they need. It is just how, how human beings are, it's just psychology. It's nothing, you know, there's no rocket science to that. Uh, do your own SWOT analysis. While you're figuring all this out, ask yourself, what are your strengths? What do you bring to the table? If you were a PM hiring manager interviewing, what would you expect from a given role? Are you meeting those strengths? What are your weaknesses? Where are your opportunities to improve yourself? And what are the possible threats? It's less about strength and weakness more than anything else and possibly opportunity, but you need to be true to yourself to understand where is it that you lack. Finally, you have to understand that it is a PM role that is very, very diversified and very, very versatile in its day-to-day -day jobs. If you remember, I told you of, of all the roles in my career, I have stayed in the PM role the longest. The reason for that is there is so much to do in the PM role, everything from writing, uh, epic or writing a user story for your engineering team to build in the next sprint to immediately switching off of that zone and going into product positioning for the upcoming launch. Switching off of that zone and now talking about pricing and competitive analysis. Switching off of that zone and now building a business case for a new product. They are all very, very different skills. And the fact that you're switching from one to the other is what keeps things very interesting. You could argue that there is a pattern in all this as well, but the fact is the patterns take so long to repeat that it keeps you interesting enough um, and it keeps you interested in the role. So that's the reason why I think the PM role is very unique compared to most others in the industry. And the other piece is once you figure out what is it, what is your why and how you would prepare, now it's time to prepare. Once you know that you want to be a PM, Go down the path, understand what is it that you're preparing for. If you have decided that you want to be a product manager in your, in your company, maybe in your own group, then you have already solved some, you have already addressed some of the variables. You know the people, you know the product, you know some of those things already. Now you just have to figure out if you are the right fit for a PM role, if there's a requisition for a PM, and if you have the right skills to survive a two hour interview or a three hour interview. You'll probably meet with four other people. One of them will be uh, the, the head of PM. Think about the questions they will ask you. And that's where the preparation comes into play. And I'll talk about the, the details of what to prepare in just a bit. Uh, so the first piece you have to know is the product. If you don't know the product, know the product. Tec technical capabilities. Go to your own website. More often than not, I realize that we don't visit our own website. We don't see what our customers see. Go to your own website, find your product, read the literature, see how marketing has positioned your own product. It may be different than what you may have imagined. So read your own positioning, get into the technical stuff, find the data sheet or find the spec, read that. Go into your forums, your user forums where customers are posing questions and your experts are giving the answers. Read through those, see how people are using the product. Understand what problems the, what problems is are being solved by your product. The one there's something that uh, one of my former peers told me. 
Customers don't have feature requests. Customers have problems. Uh, when you go talk to a customer, when I, when I have gone and spoken to customers, they never told me, hey, I've written this feature request for you. Can you go implement it for me? They will always tell you, I was trying to do this, and your product doesn't let me do that yet. Two things can happen. You can you can either say, okay, noted. Let me take a list of you know your problems, and let me go back and see what I can do. Or if you know the product well enough, you may be able to give them an alternative recommendation on how they can solve the problem. This is why I say that customers come to the table with a problem. They don't come to the table with a feature request. Because if they came to the table with a feature request, you will just take it back to engineering. Engineering will build it without even trying to understand the problem you're trying to solve. When they say they have a problem, you don't have to listen to that feature request anymore. You just have to think, how would I solve that problem? I know my product well. I know how it is used. I know these five different hacks that I can use to build this product. So what is it that I can do for this customer right now? Maybe the answer is nothing. Maybe the answer is my product can actually not solve your problem. So let me go build it for you. Or it could be that, hey, have you tried this other alternative? That may be able to solve your problem in the short term while I fix it in the long term. Because again, from, from my experience, the product managers that customers love the most, the ones for which customers are willing to get on a six hour flight and come and meet them or vice versa. Product managers are willing to get on a six hour flight to go meet the customer for one hour are the ones where there is a bi-directional trust. If customers see you as a trusted advisor, not just a vendor, then you have that customer's business. And for that, you have to know your product. Second is obviously know your customers. Um, this is a multifaceted requirement. So one is know your customers, find out how they are using your product, read your case studies and all that. And then the other aspect is talk to someone in finance and then see if they can share previous year's financial data. Again, this depends on your blackout policy requirements and um, the information that they can or cannot share with you. But if you can talk to someone from finance or who does some, some analysis for your group, try to understand what kind of customers do we have? Our top 10 customers, how much have they spent on us? Um, what is the average average sales cycle like? Um, what kind of, I mean, over how many years do customers refresh a product? Or over how many years do they renew a product? Understand their behavior so you get a better sense and better appreciation for who your customers are. Finally, know, know the industry you're in. If, if you're in cloud, then understand cloud really well. If you're in security, understand who the players are. Understand what are the trends that are facing this particular industry that the industry has to collectively solve. Doesn't matter who solves it, but you have to know your industry. You have to understand one recommendation I give, especially for uh, for most technologies, there is a research uh, agent, a, a research company called Gartner. They do a lot of uh, reports, studies. They talk to all the vendors and they publish a report every year. Most companies look forward to getting that report out because Gartner publishes what they call as a magic quadrant. Uh, wherein they call out who, who they think are the top players, who they think are have more work to do and all that. And companies look forward to that report to see their names on that report. And if they are shown as leaders, then they use that, they, they market it. They show customers that, look, we are the leader according to so-and-so agency. And like Gartner, there are many other agencies. So And you can just Google these things and find them for free. You will know what the other vendors are doing. You will know where they lack. And while that may not be 100% accurate, it's at least better than zero. It's at least better than not knowing anything about your, your landscape. So I urge you to read that. I urge you to know what's going on in your space. Finally, know your competition. Uh, I don't expect you to know your competition as good as you know yourself, but the closer you are to understanding what is it that works for them. Is it product? Is it channel? Is it go to market? What exactly works for your competition. Why do you lose against your competition? That's more important than finding out why do you win against your competition because everyone likes a success story. No one wants to talk about the losses. Go find out why you lost and that will give you more learnings. Now, the reason I'm asking you to go through those four aspects is because if you know enough about all those four parameters, your interview will be so much different than going in and saying, hey, I want to be a PM, I just don't know much 
No one wants to hire someone who doesn't know much. If you know that, if you if you can speak five five minutes average on each of those topics, they at least know you have done the homework. They may still say that you're not, you're not a fit for the role, but they will always respect hard work, and that builds credibility for a future role. Because this happened to me once. I went and prepared for an interview, and um, I was asked to uh, go talk to uh, a certain manager who had a requisition. I spoke with him. In two minutes, he decided that I wasn't the right fit. But he saw that I had done the homework. So he, re he recommended me to another peer of his who had, a, who had an opening, who was willing to accept someone who was more junior. So that always comes in handy. Hard work will never go unnoticed. So make sure you focus on those four. If there are any other aspects that you think are important, just go study. That's fine. It's always it's always possible. The one thing I didn't include there was just learning more about product management. Uh, they may ask you, what's your previous product management experience? And you may say, I'm not a product manager. I want to be one. And what works in your favor at that time is how much you know your own product and how much you know your own, um, your own space. Um, in terms of picking up product management skills, a lot of these product school videos are on YouTube. You can just go, you know, or just l listen to them as a podcast. You can even if you pick up two percent from ten different talks, that is still two percent better than where you are right now. I used to do that a lot, and it helped me immensely. And not just product school; there are so many other sources, so many experts who just share their opinion. That's just a free resource that you can go tap into. Um, once I moved into the product management role at Cisco, I did take a one-week certificate course at UC Berkeley. Now, I'm not saying that is the only way of getting in. It was a good course, but that's not the only course in the industry. Uh, most of the organizations are going to need someone with prior PM experience, which is why the hunt will take a little longer. Most of them don't want someone who can, who will have to come in and who will have to learn and then become productive. Remember the earlier discussion where I said you want you want to get your get to the point where you can add value quickly. They all are looking for someone who can hit the ground running and add value right away. Even they understand it's not ideal. They will not be getting that candidate. But the closer you are to that, the better for you. Uh, moving to PM within your own role is good. Yeah. Um, what do you suggest if you're at a company that either doesn't have product managers or a company that you don't see a future with getting in um, when you don't have PM experience? Uh, okay. So I'll just repeat the question. So what would be the recommendation if you're in, a, in an organization that doesn't have product managers or you believe that there isn't as much potential to be here, correct? Mm -hmm. So I would recommend two things. One, if I, I find it hard to believe that you wouldn't have product managers, but would you have someone similar to product managers who would interact and bring in requirements? Would you have any... Yeah, so we have more uh, product marketing people, okay. but we don't have specific product managers. But they, yeah, they could be a tool for sure. Okay. Well, the, the reason I'm trying to trying to understand is if you don't have some, if you don't have the product manager role, then who gets in the requirements to decide what gets built next in the release? Does that come from product marketing? I'm not sure. Okay. So. Oh, just, just one second, let me just answer that question. No, and I just oh, okay, go ahead. go ahead. So usually in a product-based companies, you have business consultants who okay. have the requirements and who actually plan on what's going to happen in the next spring. Okay. So it's a business consultant, so business analyst. Okay, so then... Yeah, so there could be other types of roles that yeah. contribute. There could be other roles. More than the title, look for the role that gets in requirements from customers, works with engineering, and plays that role. I would look for that role. I, I, I know someone who is currently in that situation, wants to move into product management, and uh, their title is not currently product manager, but the responsibilities are very, very similar. And that use that to your advantage. I mean, it, at the end of the day, how you craft your resume and how you make your current role look like a product manager's role uh, is up to you. If you are in a role that doesn't look like a product, that, that is not a PM title, but has the responsibilities of the PM title, you should be able to articulate that in your interview, and you should also be able to articulate that in your job description. To me, that is not lying. You're just saying that I am bringing in requirements from the field. I am communicating it to the engineering team. That's what a product manager would say. So, so that's one. 
And the other piece, if you don't see as much uh, scope within the organization, so that's a that's a hard answer, but I'll still give it. The reality is, if you're not in a product management role right now, and you're looking to get into a product management role outside, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying it will take longer for you to get into a product management role outside because one, you're changing company, and two. It depends how desperate they are to fill that requisition and if they're willing to accept someone who hasn't done product management before but shows prompts. So I would rather pick a product management or a product management like role in the current organization and then use that as uh, the catapult to get out into a company which has a, a regular product management team with those responsibilities. But that said, I wouldn't discourage you from looking out at the same time. You should you should still look out because there are still organizations which would hire junior product managers where the expectation is that you will learn a lot more on the job. No one's expecting you to build a product roadmap on day one, or no one's expecting you to come up with a prioritization or your or your strategy for the next three years. I mean, a junior PM role, no one's expecting that. If you're coming in at a director level or above, or as a senior or a principal PM, then they expect you to know some of these things or the skill to just get in, use limited limited information or just nebulous data and throw something on the board that can start to at least have a conversation, if that makes sense. Um, look for intermediate roles that lead to PM. More often than not, coming from a, typically an engineering role and getting into a product management role, it's not, it's not really straightforward. This is why I've seen many of my former colleagues go to B-School to get a, a, a part-time B-School degree and then they become product managers. Or during the, the, the B-School that they're going through for three years, they find a PM role and they transition. It's worked out very well for them. That's a tried and tested path. I know many people who do that. Well, what I'm saying is, even if you don't do that and if you're able to find a similar intermediate role, you, sh you should still be able to make that transition. Because something like a, like a part-time B-School would take you three years. And don't get me wrong, B-School teaches you a lot more than product management. People don't go to B-School for just getting product management skills. B-School teaches you how to start and run a business, which is a much bigger scope. So there's definitely value in doing that. But if your goal is to be a PM, then you can also find alternative roles. Some of, some of the examples are, uh, you could look at a field-facing or a customer-facing role. It could be a systems engineer, it could be a solutions architect, it could be a technical marketing engineer, it could be any of these intermediate roles where you can still harness your technical skills, get in front of customers, and then you do that role long enough, and now when there's a product management opening, the value you bring to the table is you know the product, you know your customers, you somewhat know your industry, and you somewhat know your competition. So you're checking two out of those four as a slam dunk, and the other two are you can at least talk, talk to them about it. And that is a good transition part. It worked for me, it worked for many of my friends who were, who were looking to go through a similar transition. So I, I do believe that that's a viable path. If you're looking to solely get into product management, if you're looking to eventually go into entrepreneurship and if you want to learn more about that, by all means, B school is a great option. Talk to PMs, I spoke about it. Uh, now let's talk about the journey getting into product management. So I did touch upon these two pieces. I, did, I just spoke about these two pieces. What, what I'm trying to convey here is, you just don't have to be in engineering. You could be in any of the other fields. By the way, I know people from each of those disciplines who have made their way into product management today. So when I was building this slide, I had them in my mind. I had those examples in my mind. I said, okay, do I know someone from training and education? Yes. What did she do? She she went for this intermediate role called systems engineering, which is a technical arm of sales. Understood the product, understood the customers. Same same drill from the previous slide. Got to know three or four out of those those four objectives, and then when the right time came, they just found the role that was open, interviewed and got in. So, product managers, product management leadership are always looking for candidates who can bring in something that their team doesn't have today. And if you have one of those skills or more of those skills, then that will always work in your favor. Um, go to MBA <coughs> if that's what you want. If not, look for the alternative role. 
get into product management. Uh, there was another piece that I wanted to discuss here, and maybe I had it in my other session. Even product management, for those of you who don't know, at least I have seen the role evolve over the past nine, ten years. Nine, ten years ago, I was used to seeing bulk of the job openings looking for product managers, just product managers. It, ex it They expected the person to know the product, they expected the person to be technical, so engineering facing, and also good in front of customers. Over time, I have seen that as Agile and Sprints have taken over, the demand of time from product managers to be inbound has tremendously gone up. They are more closely involved in stand-ups, in, in sprint planning, in delivery, in post-mortem, and all those different aspects of a sprint that they aren't getting as much time as they used to in the past to get out there and talk to customers, talk to the field. And that is almost causing the industry to look at product management in two different angles. You will still find the traditional product management roles which require someone to do both, but you will also find technical product managers. You will see these job openings, technical product managers. Um, they are re expected to primarily deal with engineering. There may be some customer engagement involved here and there, but that's not the primary expectation. And then the other one, which is more outbound and strategy focused, where you're focused on finding the next big opportunity, quantifying the market, time analysis, building a business case, talking to field, going for QBRs, the, 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 the spectrum of roles and responsibilities change. You may be on the road a little more than you will be on the, in, the in the technical PM role. Uh, so I'm seeing that. That doesn't mean that product management means you'll only see this or that. You'll also find the, the traditional ones which have both. But if you just go, and go, just go back home this evening, look into LinkedIn for job openings as product manager, and sc scroll through about 100 roles, and you will see the distinction that I'm talking about. There will be inbound, there will be regular, there will be outbound as well. So you have to ask yourself, where is it that you want to start from? More often than not, if you're starting off, a technical PM is a better fit because you probably are coming from a technology background, from an engineering background. You want to be good at that. And then once you're good at that, you can always pivot into an outbound PM. If you remember in the second slide I had told you, try to make one change at a time. Don't try too many variables. If you already are a PM and you're inbound, all you have to do is switch to outbound. That's one variable. If you are not a PM and you want to become a PM, try to keep the other variables constant so that the transition is easier on you. Uh, as you get into interviews, I understand that you're dealing with people, and people means variables. You're dealing with their own backgrounds and biases. What if you're interviewing with someone who has an MBA? They may be, may be expecting you to have an MBA as well. What if you're dealing with someone who has a very strict set of requirements for the role? I need this person to come from a consulting background, or I need this person to be a hands-on networking expert. I have seen roles and responsibilities where they expect the PM to be capable of coding. Now, that's not a traditional industry requirement, but role requires it, and you have to read into the role and understand that, if, you're, if, if you can satisfy the requirement or not. Um, what is their appetite for non-product manager? So this is where I was talking about, you want to be a PM, you're not a PM, you're interviewing for a PM role, what is their appetite? Are they open to it? Are they not open to it? So that's the, that's the other piece that you should look out for. Timing. Are you at a point where you have enough time? Are you willing to go through multiple rounds? Or have you just been interviewing for a whole year and you're so saturated that you don't want to do this anymore, but you still want to go do an interview? Or you, don't, you just don't care. You're just going to go through each interview after another. Rejection doesn't matter. Just keep powering through it which to me is the right attitude, but it's it's hard to stay upbeat the whole time. Uh, right after this slide, I'll share a personal example to that effect as well. Finally, urgency. Um, if, the, if the hiring manager has a requisition which has to close in the next two weeks, or they lose the requisition, now they are willing to be more flexible. They are willing to accept someone because they don't want to lose the rec. They would rather take someone who is not a PM, but willing to put in the work and train them over the next quarter or so, th instead of uh, letting the requisition go. So it depends on all those things. So when you go into an interview next time for a PM role, and let's say it doesn't work out for you, it's not just because you didn't have the necessary skills. 
It could be because one or many of those factors as well. And the reason I'm confidently calling out all these factors is because 2017 was my year when I faced some or all of those. So I was looking for a change and um, I was clear on what I wanted. So I was I was being picky. I was already in a, in a, in a, in a director level role by that time. And I was being picky on what I wanted to do next. And despite us being in the valley, despite us having access to so many companies and so many job openings, it took me 11 and a half months to find the role that I'm in right now. And um, I've been through all of those biases, except I was already an established PM, so the PM bias didn't apply. But their expectations on the role, their, their sense of urgency, the other candidates in the pipe, how much they were willing to pay, all these different things fall into the mixture, and it can take time. So the key takeaway from this slide is, give yourself the time and plan ahead. Don't, don't set unrealistic goals that, in six months I'm going to be a PM. It's not in your hands. It's, it, you, what, what's in your control is looking out for the right roles, looking, uh, reaching out to them, interviewing for them, and not leaving any stone unturned. You, you can do that very effectively. But you cannot uh, assert that I will be a PM in six months because you don't control the variables. So. Now, as you get into the interview, you will face some landmines because you don't come from a PM background. Depending on again the biases from the previous slide, you will you will get into um, a bunch of landmines. The first one is obviously the most obvious one. You don't have a PM experience. Here you want to pivot the discussion away from that and focus on what is it that you bring to the table. Let's say, I'll, I'll, let's play this out for a minute. Let's say you're in a team that is extremely business savvy. They know the industry, they know the customers, but they are not as product heavy. They don't know the technology as much. But you come from a QA or a development background and you know the product inside out. That becomes your value add in that team. Or let's play the other way around. Let's say you are getting into a team of extremely technical product managers who are extremely good at cracking out features one release after another, but they don't quite understand the field or they don't quite understand the competitive landscape. If you have studied for all those things as part of your preparation, then you can demonstrate that in your interview and that becomes your value add. So if you're, if you're prepared on all those four, five parameters that I had previously called out, then you can use any of those to your advantage to answer that question, the first one. We need someone to get in to hit the ground running. I, I, I heard this a lot when I was interviewing in, in my early days. Um, they don't have as much time to groom or coach a new PM. Try to get into the details. Ask them how does success look for them at the end of 90 days. When you get into the details, now you're holding them accountable for that statement. It's not just, oh, I need someone to hit the ground running. Okay, ask them, what are your top priorities for the first 90 days? What is it that needs to get done? Do you want, do you want this product launched? Or do you want the requirements written for that product? What exactly are, is a top of mind for you? Once you put them in that position, it does two things for you. It gives you crystal clear answers on how does success look. And two, you're communicating to them that I'm serious about this role. And I really need to understand what it takes to succeed. So always feel free to be curious. Feel free to dig into the details. Um, third, you're not a PM. What value do you bring to the table? It's kind of repetitive from the first one, but it's a different way of framing that same question. What do you bring to the table? You, I have made some assumptions. I, I'm assuming that you're really good at what you currently do. And that you have to bring up, because when, when you talk about something that you're good at, it shows in your body language. It shows in your, in your voice. It shows in your tone. And people pe people pick on that. People understand that this person knows what he or she is talking about. And um, that's a part, more, part you want to focus on. Is that enough to convince the interviewer? Maybe, maybe not. But that's your best chance. Now, as you move into the PM role, now I'm just playing this out that, OK, you went through maybe 15 interviews, of which one of them worked out for you. You're a PM now. Now you have to plan your move. You have to you have, you have become a product manager. How do you find your, your path to adding value as soon as possible? I covered interview. I covered preparation. Uh, I spoke about the roles that you would play, that you could take as intermediate roles. Any questions, clarifications there? Oh, Question? Yeah. 
So where will you place Scrum Master Role who is coming from an engineering background and data databases he or she is interacting with product managers as well as the like, engineering team together to come up with the release planning, sprint planning and yep. to know the parts. Where do you place that role in this? To me, to me, they still fall in that one hop away from product managers okay. because they are still interacting with product managers. They're adding some value to product managers, right. and the and in my eyes, uh, the value that a scrum master brings to the table is the connections that he or she has. Yes. So you know everyone from the ones who are who are, who are writing the code yes. to the ones who are planning the go-to-market to the ones who are doing the customer uh, who are doing the field enablement. To, to all of those little uh, aspects, and that is a value you bring to the table. You know those people. Connections matter. You, you would imagine that it's no people. No, you, you know processes as well. Right. You know people, you know processes. All you have to do now is understand your your product management specific skill sets and spend the time in knowing the product, knowing the competition, those things are called that. So th I would still keep it one hop away. Question there? Yeah. So just to add on to her question, uh, yeah. there is a thing called product owner yeah about scrum master yeah so so it's like um my question to you is it's equivalent of product manager but does it fit in outbound or does it fit inbound to me product owner is in many ways more inbound than outbound uh, just because the scope of the engagement is more on the inner circle than on the outside that's how i see it i think the the gentleman Yellow had a question. Yes, I did. Uh, so uh, probably might it might relate to you more directly in that case. Uh, I am trying to transition from my networking hardware okay. uh, camera to okay. software, okay. which I think you also yeah. did. So the challenge that I have is, of course, I understand software, but I haven't. You haven't done it. Done. It. Yeah. So how do you pivot there? So. In your current organ, in your current role, while you're doing networking, the network hardware, uh, I'm guessing you also have the equivalent embedded OS yes. aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, in addition to embedded OS, are there uh, any UI aspects of the product? Yeah, it comes under the software PLM. Okay, so what I would, what I would urge for you to consider is, as you know the, as you know one side of the house. Look for the right opportunities where you can co-own some of those software aspects. Even if it starts off with embedded, let's say do let's say do two or three releases, co-owning some capabilities on the embedded side, so you get a little more exposure on the sprint side of the house. And then, if you can also focus on, let's say, if you have a cloud component, try to at least understand that. Don't have to own the cloud side. Do a few releases with the embedded, so you get used to the sprint cycles and know enough about the cloud side so that if you're put in front of a customer, you can do a decent 15 minute pitch on what's going on. Why is the cloud different? What kind of challenges does cloud face? Why are the release cycles different? You will sound a lot more educated and uh, aware of what's happening on that side without directly owning that side. So that would be my recommendation in the short term. Because to take networking hardware and go out and apply for a software role outside, it's it's really really hard to, to show them the value you're that you're bringing to the table. Uh, I have been there, as you as you mentioned, I have been there, and that hasn't worked very well. So I I also did the exact same thing that I just told you. I was eventually asked to also co-own some of the software features, and then I also got a better understanding on the cloud side. And then when I was interviewing, I combined all of that. I didn't, I didn't make it look like it was my product or I was owning it. I said I was responsible for more end-to-end -end coverage of the product, with my primary deliverable being the hardware, but I also had a say or I also, also had an opinion mm -hmm. in how this was being done, and I'm very well aware of that procedure. And then it goes back into the variables in the interview. If the, if the, if the person has a bias of you actually having done it versus you having experienced it and to be able to talk to it, then it really depends on which side of the fence that person is, and if they're willing to accept your experience, or if they say, no, you haven't done it, so it doesn't apply. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's very uh, informative. Sure. I'm coming from the East Coast, and I came for talks like these, so it's very really okay. helpful. So I just want to understand your perspective on the program manager role. So when I go through, I understand there are a lot of uh, program manager roles 
it seems like a filler to the product manager. So what are your? I wouldn't. I wouldn't frame them that way. Okay. Program managers have their own unique position, and product managers are different than program managers. Program managers are responsible for taking uh, taking. Uh, it can vary. It could be either building a new hardware and that becomes a program, and driving it from the early cons early conception days all the way through hardware manufacturing, hardware testing and all that on the hardware side of the house. If it's a software a program that is being kicked off for a new product, then doing equivalent things on the software side, having multiple stakeholders, tracking deliverables, tracking uh, timelines, getting updates, doing all of that, following a process or creating a process and then making sure everyone follows it. So to me, program manager, project manager falls more on the PMP side of the house. To me, product management is one of the disciplines that a program manager interacts with, but not the only discipline. They sit in the middle of the entire product development ecosystem, talking to everyone from engineering, to product, to support, to marketing, to enablement, to everyone. That's program. So, that's program. Okay. Program slash project, it, it, it's used okay. interchangeably. Okay. But program, project, th those are folks that come from a very unique set of skills. And uh, uh, that's how they are different from product management. Product management comes to the table from an ownership perspective. Uh, if I see program managers as drivers who push things forward, but the idea of doing something new, the idea that this is more important than that, and, and the reason for that is this. It could be financial analysis, it could be competitive pressure, it could be all of that. I expect the product manager to know that, not the program manager. The program manager is a person who tells me that this pro this product uh, this program is at risk because of these factors, or this pro this this program is ready to be launched because we have done the final final sanity checks and the field enablement is done and all of that is done. So our generally available date should be that date. But I expect to have that conversation with a program manager, but a product manager is expected to know what to build. And once you know what to build, the program manager can then take over and help help you execute it from a process standpoint. So in your opinion, the program manager is not a filler for the product manager? No, or not in the absolutely not. Totally different. Totally different. Totally okay. different. Companies use them, use, some companies use them interchangeably, but most of Silicon Valley very well understands the difference between a program slash project manager and a product manager. And that's very, very well understood. Uh, I know there are sales engineering roles yeah. next one. So is it uh, something like a solution uh, developer or is it company? So sales engineering roles apply to all companies when they are the sales, uh, they are the technical arm of the sales team. The sales person who goes in will always pitch the solution, talk about pricing, talk about discounting and all that. But at, at some point, the customer wants to see uh, the proof. They want to see a demo. They want a technical conversation. They want an architectural conversation. That is where the sales engineer would play a role. And if needed, the sales engineer would then pull in a specialist or an architect to have a more in-depth discussion. If you, if you are a sales engineer in a big company which has many products, it's impractical to expect the sales engineer to know all of all the products in a reasonable amount of depth. He or she can talk to each of the solutions with some level of depth, with some level of, of expertise. But then when the customer wants a deep dive, they will have to go and tap into the specialists. So both sales engineers and specialists and or architects or consultants are all part of the one hop away network from product management, which if you are in that position, at some point you can hop into product management. So uh, my experience is more on the engineering side yep. for nine years, uh, but uh, I haven't done a lot of customer facing work. Okay. So is transitioning to sales engineer role uh, considered one step closer to getting to product management? Or? Depends how you frame it. Yes, it is possible. So you could go from engineering to sales engineering. Uh, that assumes that you you may not have gone in front of customers, but you're comfortable getting in front of an audience and presenting because a sales engineer would more often than not be taking your 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 solutions uh, presentation, talking to the customer on how this is how we solve the problem and this is why, things like that. So that that 
that sense of authority is, is required. And um, once you are a sales engineer, then again, subject to the right opportunity and right situations, you could make a case for becoming a product manager. And then the value you bring to the table is you know your customers well and you know your product. Go ahead. You mentioned a, a, a lot of different roles uh, on, the, on the left side and mm -hmm. the transition. And, yeah. and I'd like to question the question that one made regarding the uh, program manager yeah. and technical program manager. How do you see that a program manager can transition to the product manager? Okay, so program managers are, uh, to me, program managers are the hub. If you were to take the example of a wheel, which has spokes in it, to me, program managers in many sense are like the hub who ensure that to keep a program moving along, they keep every department or every group in, uh, they keep that group accountable for whatever it is that they have to deliver. They communicate updates to everyone, they seek input from others, and they make sure that the program continues on its path towards a successful execution. If something is not going as planned, their job is to highlight it and, and, and show the red flag. If something is good, their, their role is to announce that this, this release has gone out. How does that role, how can that role make a play for a product manager role? That role, in addition to knowing the processes within the organization, knowing the people within the organization, knowing the, knowing the, the procedure for, for, for building a new release or for following a new product, product development, would also have to then spend time in understanding the product itself. The program manager, by definition, may not be expected to know the product. But now, to be a product manager, you have to know the product. So, that's where the preparation comes into play. You have to then spend time in knowing the product. You have to then spend time in understanding who is using the product, understand how is the industry shaping up, and then when you go for an interview, you, you show or you showcase the knowledge that you have gained and also the fact that you know how the system works. So your value add in that case is how product development works. You know that process. You have connections in the field. You know a, a bunch of customers who can be good references or good beta customers because they were uh, interacting with you in one of your past releases. You get all those connections to the table and that can be valuable in some cases. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think of a PM internship or like a co-op instead of like an MBA or that middle section, do you think it's risky? Do you think, um, have you seen that path where they end up getting a full-time job after? If you, um, I've seen it becoming a full-time job in cases of students who are still in grad school or undergrad going and doing an internship. Mm -hmm. And they do a co-op, a six-month co-op or a three-month internship. And that now gets on their resume. And depending on the company's hiring policy upon graduation, they can come back to pursue a full-time role as a product manager. So I have seen it working in that context. Um, I find it hard to see how someone who may be in a regular full-time role uh, used, take time off of that to go do a three-month internship. That, I haven't seen much of that happen because then you would be essentially leaving your existing role and at the end of internship, you don't know if that role is still there or not, right? right. So I, I don't see as many internships work that way, but the, the middle ground is organizations that are open to having rotational programs for people from one role to go experience the other role for X number of weeks. And companies are starting to look into that as a way to retain employees, as a way to show them a career path, as a way to groom them and to, to minimize the attrition. So look for, look, look for those kinds of things. If they, have, if they have like a mentoring program or a rotational program where you can go and co-own something, and the other piece is, as you have your career development discussion, be candid with your manager about your goals and what you want to do, let's say a year to 18 months down the line, so you can get the support that you need from them as well. If you position it as something you want to do right now, then you're putting them also in a difficult position because you are a resource who is expected to, to deliver on something, but now you're looking out to, for another role which is counterintuitive for them. So 
be candid about what you want to do and plan for it to be like 12 months out or so, 12 months or more, and then work towards it. So if you want to go take a course, they may be able to fund it, depends. Some other questions in the middle? Yeah. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, do you have any skill set that is like must needed for a product manager? Like as you just mentioned for program manager that you need to be knowing the processes. Yeah. Is there something for a product manager that you must have in order to consider that role? So I had the exact same question the last time I spoke as well. And the answer I gave was um, the requirements of a product manager in a given role, in a given organization can be different. I, I won't say there is one skill you need to have, but I would say there are three or four baselines, which if you have, can, can be valuable. One, um, more often than not, in a generic product management role, there are aspects of financial analysis and aspects of just being good with numbers. So just doing analysis, um, be it you know looking at pricing, being at discounting, calculating ASPs, whatever that may be, just general analysis. I would call that as one bucket. The other bucket is just being good with slides, being able to tell a story. If you have Toastmasters, go join it. If you want to go take a presentation course, go join it. But I highly encourage all of you to be extremely comfortable getting in front of an audience and presenting. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one point that has worked for me is if you know the content that you're presenting and if you have spent enough time knowing it, then it shows that that conviction shows in your voice. And then the audience automatically starts to believe that this person knows what he or she is talking about. So preparation as you work on your presentation is really important. So that's the presentation aspect. You've got the financial aspect, the presentation aspect. Third one is uh, technical. Whatever you're doing, always have the sense of curiosity. Try to get deeper into what's going on. Try to ask the questions. Try to more often than not, I have, I, have, I have been in situations where I have asked questions which were supposed to be stupid, and I, I, still, I have still asked them anyways, because I, I have to get that answer. And I don't mind if someone thinks that the question was foolish. I would still go ahead and ask <coughs> it. Uh, being not afraid to ask those questions, and being able to build relationships with the right people who, can, who are more than willing to share the information with you. Because sometimes you post a question on an alias, you may get an answer or people may just assume why doesn't this person know the answer to that question. But if you get a person offline and just tell them, hey, I'm trying to learn this, I was wondering where I could better understand, blah. And then that person may be more, more willing to help you out. So the sense of curiosity with being technical is a third bucket. If you can cover these three, I think you're in a pretty good position to, to get into a product management room. But but those, to me, those are general life skills that will help you with everything else as well. But I've just seen that a good product manager is expected to know these three things at the very minimum. Thank you. Any other so questions before we proceed? Other questions. Yeah. As a product manager, uh, what do you? What are your main responsibilities? Like, what do you? Um, so I'm like I'm from a dev background, and I'm looking for a switch. I worked a lot with uh, directly with customers in the field, and I have like debugging the solutions mm -hmm. and providing them a solution and that kind of thing. But now I want to move uh, to um, technical uh, marketing or TPM role, yeah. as you said. So I was wondering like how this, how, uh, and I'm not looking in my current company, uh, I'm looking outside. Okay. So what does your day look like, like so as a product manager? My focus today, my charter today is field product management. So I'm more focused on the outbound. Okay. I'm not a TPM. Okay. I used to have TPM as one of my job responsibilities in my past life. Okay. Specific to me, specific to my current role, my focus is more on the customers today. My focus is more on my field uh, and on the GTM side. Okay. So maturing the GTM processes, tracking metrics, defining telemetry, <coughs> um, I, I'm, I, or at least assisting teams in doing all those things okay. is my primary responsibilities today. Um, I'm also... Uh, so I'm also having the responsibility of being the voice of the customer, being the voice of the field back into the factory. Uh, because the factory is so busy building the product that they don't get as much exposure out to the field. So having that close, close connections with the field and understanding what is working, what is not working in the current product is part of my responsibility as well. So yeah, it's more outbound. So then there, uh, 
a product manager who is focusing more yes. on, on building the product? Yes, system? yes, that, that, that's how, a different How do you coordinate? Because it's a little bit challenging who will be setting the priorities of what to be, or what features to be built. Oh, that, that part is very clear. They set the priorities for what to build. I don't set the priorities on that. I tell them what's going on in the industry. I tell them what's going on in the field. I tell them if there's a pricing pressure. I tell them why we lose when we go up against some competitor. I tell them and the broader organization where is the next opportunity and how big the opportunity is. So that's what I'm focused on. Uh, I don't own the product today and that's not part of the charter either. I'm more focused on the field and, and improving and maturing the processes and finding newer markets to invest in. Is this quite common within the companies here? I thought that you um, No. Yes and no. So I know organizations that have this role uh, established, like Cisco has it, HP has it, Oracle has it, Splunk has it. So there are companies that do have it, mostly the larger organizations. In the smaller ones, it's usually one person that is required to split time between both. So this, this is more like business development. Uh, so you are the basically on the product marketing, correct? No, I'm not in product marketing. It's called field product management. So it's more outbound product management. Uh, and to your point, business development is traditionally seen as more partners and ecosystem. There is a separate team responsible for doing that. Mine is again, as I said, it's outbound product management, so more on the strategy, GTM, that side. But the, the GTM knowledge that comes under the product marketing. GTM comes under product marketing, but when, but no one in product marketing necessarily looks at the entire GTM end to end, and they need someone to look at that, and that's where my role comes in. Yeah, uh, from your experience, if you uh, if you're targeting a product manager role uh, within the top uh, tech company, for yeah. example, Fang. So I've spoken to a few people. It seems like they are looking for computer science engineering and they're uh -huh. looking for prior product manager experience. So what in your is that correct? Or um, I think the job description that you read on LinkedIn or any or any other job website is a, is a fairly good indicator of what prerequisites are acceptable. Uh, if they more often than not, I have seen either electrical or computer science or computer engineering. Uh, off late, I have seen um, data science as being one of the other courses. So these seem to be like the evergreen courses that seem to lead into roles, either into tech engineering roles, which can then eventually lead to product management. Yeah, I, I would trust the job description. When a hiring manager is looking at your resume, do they just go by the role that you have worked in your previous company, or as you just said, do they go through the description? Because, you know, I am from a business consultant. I have a background of business consultant. I do what a product manager does, and I work for a product management company. So, you know, the roles and responsibilities seem to be, you know, going in sync. But it, I don't know. It's just that I feel that the hiring managers just look at, okay, she's a business consultant and not a product manager. Correct. So, do you um, have to switch the role while applying? Or? No, uh, that can that may potentially backfire. So, I wouldn't switch the role because uh, sometimes they also have background verification. And mm -hmm. when they call your current employer, they want to know what your current title is. So, you don't want that to, to spark any kind of confusion. Um, I wouldn't change on that. The hard answer is some people decide based on your current title. Some people will read the job description. But more often than not, there is usually a recruiter who, who from the organization who will um, shortlist your resume before it goes to the hiring manager. And when, the, when a recruiter shortlists your resume, more often than not, he or she will reach out to you to, to understand more about the role. To me, that is the opportunity for you to tell them that while my title is business consulting, I have been doing these 10 things, which a typical product manager does, which is why I'm a good fit for this role based on the job description you have provided. And I would I would call it out exclusively for them to highlight that so that the hiring manager has a context. Because without that context, the hiring manager is just going to move on. So that's what I would do in that situation. So the product owner over role is different from the product manager. The product owner is morally inbound with the team developing team and uh, then they interact with product managers as well, right? So that's a difficult question to answer and I'll tell you why. The whole agile sprint culture in Bay Area has been, um, has been uh, twisted 
to suit the organization's requirements. I don't see organizations following pure agile. In some companies, product owner is a different role than a technical product manager. In some organizations, the product manager plays the TPO role. So it, 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 the answer really varies. You'll have to find out what the organization is doing. Okay. Which is why more often than not, everyone is doing fragile. No one is doing agile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I just yeah. had a question with what you said, GTM end-to-end. -end. Can yeah. you explain to me? Like okay, so, so a good example is, let's say the organization uh, wants to understand what is their product penetration in the industry. So they are selling it to a bunch of customers. Uh, let's say, uh, in, in terms of large customers, of the list of large customers that they think what their total addressable market is, how far penetrated are they relative to their competition? One, one you need to understand that. Once you understand that, now the question is, okay, where is it that you think you should be relative to where you are now? Once you know where you should be, then you, the question is, okay, what kind of go-to-market motions are required to get there? What kind of discipline is required to get there? What kind of frameworks do you need to have in place? You can't just randomly build campaigns and, and just go let them out, expecting product penetration to improve. There's a, certain, there's a certain level of discipline required to be executed, and there's a certain framework that needs to be put in place. More, more often than not, organizations miss that nuance because of which they think they are doing stuff. But as I say, right, a, a, the difference between a rocking horse and a running horse is the running horse is making progress, the rocking horse is just moving. So how do you not get yourself in the position of being a rocking horse? Um, this kind of the example that I would give. So like capacity planning, like... When you're, when you're more focused on the GTM side, you have to understand what your current capacity is and what you can do. That's where you would partner with product marketing and others. But more often than not, I have seen that even within marketing, they all seem to be focused on their own area of influence. No one seems to be looking at end-to-end -end from, let's say, a customer's perspective. And that's where you get to define, okay, this is how we should be executing, especially if you're a company that's growing rapidly, who wants to have a very, very low touch business model for scale, that's when those things come into play. Um, all right, first week, first month, you're gonna have some or all of these questions in your mind. I'm not gonna read them out. You will have the slides, but the idea is, uh, what can I do in this role so that I can start adding value as soon as possible? Uh, you all are going to have these questions and you're also trying to figure out your dynamics. Uh, am I? Am I uh, who are my support system here? What can I do? What can I not do? What questions can I ask? What can I not ask? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, in the early days, possible challenges. You don't quite know. You're hired as a PM, but you don't quite know what your exact role and responsibility is. The way to tackle that is meet with your manager up front. Have a clear, clear conversation about what is it that he or she has in mind for you. How does he or she see your role evolve? Ask them for their nirvana state. What did they have in mind when they hired you? And uh, what gap are you looking to solve and go, or are you looking to fill? Uh, get clarity on that. The other piece is if, if you believe you don't have enough knowledge about PM best practices, that's a bad question to ask outside because that shows lack of, lack of readiness on your part. It's important to understand what your shortcomings are and then find the right resources to prepare for them. It could be a course, it could be internal processes. There are organizations that have product management courses within the organization that train you on how to be a good PM for that organization because everyone does things differently. So I would, I would focus on that. How can I add value? You have to start from a position of strength. Always start from a position of strength. If you're good at, let's say, um, Conveying, start, conveying vision and strategy, then the, the immediate place where you can add value is getting in front of customers for roadmap conversations. Find the latest roadmap deck. Have someone present it to you. Understand how it is done. Then volunteer to go and do roadmap presentations for customers. Get that feedback back to your team. That's one example. If you're really technical, if you're really good at a whiteboard conversation with a customer, same thing. Reach out to customers where you can go have whiteboard conversations uh, solve their problems, capture their requirements, come back, report it, document your trip report so that people know that you're doing something that's adding value. Um, if you're good at positioning messaging, help them with 
um, a new content that can be written, a new white paper or a new blog that can be written. There are always places, uh, every role adds a certain amount of value that they each bring to the table. Um, if you haven't had enough presentation experience, I would urge you to fix that as soon as you can. Uh, the more comfortable you are getting in front of larger crowds or customers or even a difficult crowd, uh, uh, the better you are. Um, I would urge some of your peers who, let's say you are good at vision and roadmap presentation, you're not good at a technical presentation, pick a technical deck, have a subject matter expert be your audience and have them be a very difficult audience. Have them poke questions at you and see if you can answer questions. If you cannot answer questions, ask them for the right answer that you should be having. Because I've had a variety of customer discussions. I've had discussions where customers are incredibly sharp and they know what they're asking. And I have that means I have to be prepared for that conversation. And sometimes customers just want to feel good about the fact that you are focusing on something important and their investment is secure. So you'll see both sides of customers. You want to be prepared for the former, not the latter. The latter are the good customers where the conversation is easy. You want to be prepared for the really difficult conversations. Uh, is there a place to get the templates for yeah. the decks, like the product roadmap or something like that? Correct. So is there a... Uh, every organization has... So normally the templates are made by the marketing team and then everyone else follows a template to build the presentation. You don't have to go build a presentation grounds up. Most likely it's already created. You just have to find what the latest deck is and then practice on it. If they don't have it, then... If they don't have it, then the question is, why, why is it that they don't have it? What is it that they are using for customer presentations today? Sometimes it's just tribal knowledge. People build their own private version, keep it on their laptop, and they present it. Instead of uh, keeping it in a shared location where everyone can access it, that may be an initiative for you to put a process around how uh, customer-facing decks get maintained, updated, presented, because everyone could use a little more discipline in the way things get done. Uh, uh, a deck on a laptop is just one step away from getting lost if something happens to the laptop. Uh, there, was, there, was one, there was one more question. Yeah, I mean, on similar lines. So, so if not within the company, uh, do you know any sources uh, online which are like credible and good that you would recommend? Uh, for? For these kind of decks or presentation? Uh, Every, uh, so uh, technically there are so many, right? So, like, that you think is, is good? <laughs> so presentations are generally uh, unique to that company. Okay. And um, if anything, those things don't get discussed unless there is a non-disclosure agreement with the customer. So you won't find that material publicly. Okay. You will have to learn it once you get on the job. Okay. Uh, questions you shouldn't be asking. How do I learn the product? Where do I start from learning the product? Uh, the so. I had my grad school done in, in, in the East Coast. I did my internship in the East Coast. The culture there was very different than the way Silicon Valley operates. Um, in East Coast, there was a lot more, for lack of a better term, spoon feeding and coaching and help. Uh, the team is more more willing to help you out. Uh, West Coast is, in true, the true sense, wild, wild west. No one has the time. People expect you to be as productive as soon as you can. Uh, you will have to be able to help yourself. And the sooner you get comfortable with that notion, the better for you. So yeah, the first couple of times where I was required to learn something, it was a disaster up until I learned the culture. Once I learned, learned the culture, doing everything else was easy. I thought the reverse way. OK. Um, do I need to know other aspects of EM? Am I really good at ABC? You may be good. You, you are good at something in your current role. Whatever it is that you're doing, you have to be good at that. You just have to fill in the gaps for the other aspects. When I moved into a product manager's position, I was the most technical guy in the team. I was the only guy who could talk about a packet walk within the ASIC because nobody else could. And uh, that was my strength that I brought to the table. I could get in front of, I did actually get in front of a crowd of 300, 350 technical solutions architects at Cisco to talk to them about the new product, the new feature, and get, get into the details of it in a two-hour session, which uh, with uh, which others could not. So that is a value I brought to the table. At that time, what I could not do was financial analysis. So I picked that up along the way by spending time with those who were really good at it, asking them to explain to me, asking them to give me some projects, offloading some of their work. It, it does mean I put in the extra hours, but then 
in the long term it, it just pays out make yourself relevant bring your old experience to the table know the product don't be afraid to get hands on even if you're a product manager the more you're in the product the more uh, the more conviction you have when you talk about it if you are not in the product if you have just read the literature it will also show in your voice if you are hands on with the product and if you have used it everyone can see it right away when you talk about it um, there are once you are a product manager there is so much information available at your disposal it's up to you if you want to tap into it or not um, everything from previous financial information sales trends uh, information about your customer base, customer spending, average sale price, market segmentation, you name it. All of that is available at your disposal. It's completely up to you if you want to tap into it and if you want to learn more about it or not. And you should do that in your spare time because on your on, for your regular day job, your manager would still have expectations on what you should be doing. So find those early opportunities to contribute. Build your 30-60-90. I'm a big believer in 30-60-90. Uh, have this conversation early on. Build your draft template of what a 30-day plan should be, what a 90-day plan should be, what a 60-day plan should be. And show your progression. In the first 30 days, I'll be comfortable presenting this deck in front of customers. In 60 days, I will have, have built my own test setup. I would have had my own lab environment where I can play with the product. Or maybe that happens in 30 days, whatever that may be. And by 90 days, I should have taken ownership of something and delivered something. So at the end of 90 days, you're giving in your manager enough ammunition to justify your presence in the organization. This person is here because this person has done blah, blah, and blah. You want to get to that position. This is the last slide. In summary, these are the 10 things I, I want you to take away from this session. Regardless of your current position, you can be a PM. MBA is not the only path to get there. There are intermediate paths which will help you get to the product management role. Preparation, preparation, preparation. I've given the areas that you have to focus on. The, you, you can never be too ready for this position. Uh, you have to understand all those key trends, product, technology, all of that. Uh, don't be afraid to bring up ideas or seek clarity. Find your champions. Find out who is more open to ideas, who is not. And bring up bounce off your ideas with them before bringing it to a, to a larger audience. Some people are just not comfortable bringing up an idea in a larger crowd of people who know what they're talking about. Find the softest target and go talk to them about it. Uh, be an excellent storyteller. Regardless of you knowing the product or not, be an excellent storyteller. Um, go to your customers, go out to the field, go talk to your customers at least once a quarter, if not more often. Find the customers who are having a pain point right now. Find a customer who did not bring your business to you recently. Go talk to them. Ask them, why did I lose? Tell me tell me more. They will appreciate that. They will remember that for the next time. Um, always build a good relationship with your one-hop counterparts. If you don't have the, the respect of engineers, product marketing, sales, customer support, business development, all the surrounding functions, it will be hard to establish yourself as a good product leader. They all look up to you as the person who knows what to do. They all look up to you for guidance. You have to build that trust with them. And finally, remember to have fun. It's a fun-filled role. I can be a product manager all my life because there's just so many interesting things to do in this role. Remember to have fun because if you're not having fun, you're not going to be in the role for too long. So that's my uh, view of how to get into the, into the function.